Good morning. If you got your Bibles, let's turn over to Genesis chapter 3 this morning. We have begun a series through the first 11 chapters of Genesis through uh, the creation accounts, and we've talked about uh, the fact that uh, the uh, title of this series is First Things First, First Things. So we're going to talk about first things. This morning, the passage we're going to look at is especially important. It is especially important because if you're going to understand the Bible, you have to understand this passage. And I'm going to argue also, if you're going to understand the world, you're going to have to understand what's happening in this passage this morning. If you're going to understand why there is death and heartache and pain, why bad things seemingly happen to, to seemingly good people, you're going to have to understand this passage. If you're going to understand why we need a Savior, why Jesus Christ had to come and live a perfect life and die on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins, you're going to have to understand this passage. In our scripture this morning in Genesis chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his holy and inspired and inerrant word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have given us the truth of your word, that you have spoken to us. And Lord, we ask that we would understand, we would hear, and that we would believe. Lord, we thank you for explaining to us the things that have, that have gone, to, uh, gone before us, the things that have happened, that we might understand why the world is the way it is today. Help us, Lord, to accept your word, to receive it with, with joy, with gladness, and, Lord, that we would respond, that our lives would be different because of it. In Christ's name we pray these things. Amen. <clears throat> I don't know about you, but, but I've heard people from time to time try to excuse somebody's behavior because it's just their nature. You ever heard somebody say that? Oh yeah, he is as grumpy as you could possibly be, but it's just his nature. Like that's okay. I, I've heard people, I've worked with people, they've said, well, uh, she's just friendly by nature, or he's just quiet by nature, or she's just shy by nature. The truth is we all act according to our nature, don't we? We behave according to our nature. Even animals do that. Animals behave according to their nature. My daughter uh, told me just recently that her cat brought her a present, brought her a dead mouse. Because <laughs> cats kill mice. That's just their nature. They're going to kill mice. That's just what they do. Uh, we all act according to our nature. Cats hunt mice. Uh, dogs chase cats. Things act according to their nature. And in our scripture this morning, the Bible teaches us about our nature, about who we are. It also teaches us about the nature of our great adversary, Satan. And most importantly, it teaches us about the nature of our God. This passage is the most important passage in the Bible if you are going to understand all of human history. If you're going to understand why the world is the way it is today, if you're going to understand why the Lord relates to us in the way that He does, if you're going to understand our need for salvation, all of that is bound up in this passage. So let's begin this morning by looking at the nature of our enemy, the nature of Satan. The Bible teaches that he is by nature a deceiver. Now, sin did not actually start on earth. Sin began in heaven. When the, the uh, uh, angel Lucifer, uh, the angel that God had created, the, the uh, high point of, of God's creation uh, as far as the angels go, uh, desired the glory of God for himself. 
He desired something that did not belong to him. He wanted the glory of God. And the Bible says that he was cast out of heaven because of that, and he took with him a third of the angels, which we know as demons today. And the Bible teaches us that he is by nature a deceiver. He is by nature a liar. Jesus tells us in John chapter 8, verse 44, He was a murderer, meaning Satan, from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. So when Satan approaches Adam and Eve, when he approaches Eve specifically here, when he approaches Eve, he does this with a mind towards destroying her, with a mind towards doing something that is going to sever her relationship with the Lord God. He is striking at God, but since he cannot strike directly at God, he strikes indirectly at God by striking God's creation, that which he loves the most, human, humanity. And he goes to Eve and he strikes at her by planting doubt in her mind. Now he knows that if he is going to bring down Adam and Eve and he is going to strike a blow against humanity, he knows that the place that he's going to do that is going to be at God's Word. Did you know that the only weapon we have, the, the only true weapon we have to defeat Satan, to defeat his deception and his lies, his all, the only weapon we really have is the Word of Almighty God. And so Satan strikes at that. When he wants to bring down Adam and Eve, he starts by attacking God's Word, and he attacks it in three different ways. He begins, when he comes to, to, to Eve, <clears throat> He begins by attacking the authorship of God's Word. Look at verse 1. He says, Has God indeed said? Has God really said? You shall not eat of the tree of the, the garden? Eat of every tree of the garden? Universe. I know there are some people who will look at the, the Genesis account and they'll say, well, that's not science, and, and they will accuse us of, of being opposed to science. I want you to know something, folks. I am not opposed to science. When I was in school, I loved science. Science was my, my, probably my favorite uh, uh, subject when I was in school. But we have to understand something about science. Science has its limits. Science can teach us a number of things, but it does not teach us all truth. There are some things that we have to look elsewhere to find the truth. Science, by its very nature, is incomplete and imperfect. Scientists like to speak today of the, uh, the concept of a, a five-year half-life for all scientific facts. What that means is that in five years, half of what science believes will be proven wrong. Half of what they believe will, will be uh, out of date. It will be outmoded. And, and so uh, science is not perfect. Science does not teach us all things that we need to know. Science can never know everything, especially when we start talking about what happened in the past. If you look at a pendulum, the swinging back and forth, Science can tell you at, what, uh, at any point in the future how far that pendulum will swing, how, how wide its swing will be, how fast its swing will be. But the one thing science can never tell you is what hand started that pendulum swinging in the first place. Some things just have to be revealed to us. If you want to know what happened in the past, you have to ask somebody who was there, somebody who saw it, someone who could give you an account of what happened in the past. And folks, at the creation, there was only one person there who can tell us what happened. The Lord God. He was the only one there and the only one who can give us an account of what happened at creation. Now, of course, I know there are many pagan accounts of creation. Uh, many other religions have their ideas of, of uh, how the universe came into being. But the book of Genesis, the book of Genesis is the only one that is a reliable narrative. Only the book of Genesis has the marks of a historical account. The book of Genesis is not some myth. It's not some allegorical tale that contains a kernel of truth here and there. It is God's account of how He brought everything into existence. 
And let me just quickly begin this, this morning by, by discussing the issue of, of authority. Um, each one of us has to decide what authority we're going to rely on. What authority tells us the truth? What authority do we trust the most? Folks, for me, the Bible is my final authority. Now, I may look to history, I may look to science, I may look to some other uh, authorities to learn a few things, but when history or science or any other authority comes into conflict with the Bible, it is the Bible that I depend on. The Bible is truth. Now, the reason I do that is because the Bible alone is the only source that has never misled me. It is the only source that has never been proven wrong. It is the only source that never makes a mistake. Our scripture is truth without a mixture of error. It is absolutely reliable in everything that it speaks to us. And some of you remember when you were in school, you remember hearing about the Scopes trial. You used to call it the Scopes monkey trial. Uh, Clarence Darrow in the Scopes trial presented a, a number of proofs for evolution, scientific proofs that evolution was absolutely true. Do you know that every single proof that Clarence Darrow presented in the Scopes trial for the, to prove evolution, every single proof he presented has since been proven wrong by science. I was reading an article by Mike Rowe recently. Mike Rowe, uh, he narrates a, a show on science on television. Some of you might have heard it. It's a wonderful show. I love to listen to him sometimes. But he, he wrote an article recently about the fact that quite often he will narrate a show and before the show even airs, they have to call him and tell him to go back and redo it because the facts have changed. Look, science is not perfectly reliable. Science will lead you wrong from time to time. Science is in error quite often. But the Bible is never in error. The Bible is always true in everything that it speaks to us. And it begins with these words. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The Bible assumes it begins with the concept that there is a God. The Bible never apologizes for the concept that there is a God. It states it as a fundamental principle. The Bible doesn't try to justify the idea of a God. It doesn't try to prove God's existence. It simply assumes everybody knows there is a God. I'm going to let you in a little secret, folks. I'm going to let you know something that, that, that you may not know. Everybody believes in God. I've met some atheists. I've met some folks that say, well, I don't believe in God. You know what the Bible says in Romans chapter 1? The Bible says in Romans chapter 1, everyone knows there's a God. It's just that some people suppress the truth. Everyone deep down, deep down in their heart, really knows there's a God. I have a wonderful book on my shelf in my library. It's entitled, Does God Believe in Atheists? And the answer to that, that question is, no, he does not. God says he has planted the knowledge of himself in every heart and every mind and every creature. We know in our hearts there really is a creator. A God who has created all things. And created all things from nothing. God has brought the entire universe into existence by the force of His will. By the power of His word alone, He created the heavens and the earth, the stars, the planets, the galaxies, all these, and an empty, unorganized, barren earth He sets in place. Verse 2. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of of the waters. Now I'm going to tell you just uh, from the very beginning here, I believe in a literal six day creation. That God created the universe in six days. Now, I know there are some people that will argue with that. I know there are some people that will come up with other ideas, but I think it is just the clear reading of the text. The clearest reading of the text is that God created the heavens and the earth. He created all that there is in six literal days. 
Now when I was in, uh, in seminary, I took a preaching class. And uh, in this preaching class, uh, at one point I preached from Genesis chapter 3. And I, I preached about uh, Adam and Eve. And the fact that they were, they uh, fell, that they, they broke God's commandments, they fell. And I remember this pr preaching professor who was kind of a liberal guy. Uh, after it was over, he was critiquing my sermon. And uh, it was kind of interesting because he couldn't preach his way out of a paper bag if he had to, but, but he was critiquing my sermon. And so he, he stands up and he's talking about this, this sermon and he says, uh, uh, are you really going to look at people who have automobiles and color television sets and microwave ovens and tell them there was a literal Adam and Eve? And I said, well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to do more than that. I don't tell them there was an Adam and an Eve that literally were two people and there was a snake and a tree and a fruit in the garden and I'm going to tell them as we go through the Bible that there was a man named Balaam who had a donkey that talked to him and there was a man named Jonah who got swallowed by a fish and I'm going to tell them that there was a man named Jesus who was the living son of God who died on the cross who was buried and on the third day got up and walked out of that cross out of that, out of that tomb folks that's what I'm going to tell people because I believe the word of God God is true. It's true. And it tells me God created all things in six days. God created all things in six days. I believe it. And the Bible says that as He created all, things, all these things in six days, that He did it in, in three stages here. First, He deals with the darkness. Look at verse 3. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. God called the day the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. God speaks, and light comes into being. God says, light be, and it is. God speaks, and it happens. God, when God wanted to put on flesh and blood, when He wanted to add humanity to His you know, human nature, to, to His divine nature, He did that and He walked amongst us and He demonstrated His power. The Bible tells us that one day He was in a boat with the disciples and a storm comes up on them and He stands up. The disciples are terrified and He says, Peace, be still. And it was peaceful. The Bible tells us that Jesus, in John chapter 11, speaks. He says, Lazarus, come forth. And a dead man got up and walked out. The Bible teaches that Jesus said to the leper, be clean, and he was clean. He said to the lame man, walk, and he walked and leapt and ran. He says to the bound, be free, and prison doors are open. He says to the frightened heart, be calm, and they have peace beyond comprehension. And he says to the sinner, be made clean, be forgiven, and we are clean. We are made white as snow. With a word, God can accomplish his will. With a word, he brought light out of the darkness. And with a word, folks, he can still bring you out of the darkness of sin and despair. God is still in the business of bringing light to dark places. And folks, you may be here this morning, you may be thinking, well, Pastor, you don't know how deep my sin is. I I've talked to people. I've sat in their living rooms and talked to folks and and I've had people say, Pastor, you just, you just don't know what I've done in the past. You don't know how deep my darkness is. You don't know how much I've sinned. You don't know how bad a sinner I am, Pastor. God can never forgive me. Let me tell you something, folks. I don't know how deep and how dark your sin is. But I know how great our Savior is. And I know He is sufficient for every need. There is no sin that you have committed that our God, through the blood of Jesus Christ, cannot forgive. He dealt with the darkness. He also dealt with disorder in verse 6. <coughs> verse 6. Then God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. So the evening and the morning were the second day. 
Then God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so, and God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. God brings order from disorder. He separates the water vapor in the air from the water on the surface. And on the surface, he separates the land from the sea, and he tells the sea, you can come this far and no farther. The God who brought order to the universe stands ready to bring order to your life as well. You know, one of the real big problems with sin, with being a person who does not know Jesus Christ, one of the big problems with sin is that it just brings so much disorder in your life. And there's so much drama in people's lives because of sin. I can't tell you how many times I've stood in hospitals, I've stood in funeral homes, I've sat in people's living rooms, and they've talked to me and they've told me about the, the disorder in their lives and the drama and, and the, the things that are going on. And, and I've talked to them and I've tried to explain to them, if you just give your life to Jesus Christ, He can bring, bring order to the disorder. He can bring order to your life. He can bring peace that passeth understanding. He can bring you a sense of His presence. God is a God of order. Your life might be barren and confused today. You may have no direction in your life. God can cure that. He can give you direction and peace and order in your life. We see third that God deals with the deadness simply creating a, 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 an orderly universe and a well-lit world wasn't enough for God. God wants life. And so God creates a world that is teeming with life. Look at verse 11. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit that yields fruit according, a uh, fruit tree that yields fruit according to the kind, its kind whose seed is in itself on the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields seed according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit, whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the third day. God declares that life should exist. Specifically here, plant life. Now note, when He creates plant life, He does not create some, some primordial ooze here. Okay, I, I would just want you to know, I do not believe that we evolved from some single cell organism out there. I've heard it described as the theory that, that you came from goo to you via the zoo. I don't believe in that. God creates life, fully formed, in staggering variety here. And what's more, many scientists, if you talk to them, they will admit that when they look at the fossil record, what they see is life springing into existence in staggering variety, and they are at a loss to explain how that happened. The Bible tells us God spoke, and it happened. The plants need sunlight, and so He creates the sun and the moon in verse 14. Then God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. Then God made two great lights. The greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth and to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the fourth day. You know what I think is interesting? When we look at this right here, it, he takes six verses. God takes six verses to describe the creation of the sun and the moon. Just six verses. Folks, when you go through the Bible, later on, uh, we'll find that God will take 50 chapters to describe the construction of the temple, but only six verses to talk about the sun and the moon. You know why that is? Because the Bible is all about redemption. The Bible is all about God's love for you. That's God's great passion. Human beings are God's great passion. 
compassion, the redemption of human beings, the creation of the sun and moon, that's nothing to God. God speaks and it pops into existence. But to redeem mankind, He had to do much more than speak. In order to redeem mankind, God gets His hands dirty. God sends His only begotten Son to live a perfect life, to walk this earth as a peasant, to die on the cross, to be buried, and on the third day raised from the dead. In order for you and me to be redeemed, God had to do much more than just speak. He had to send His only Son to suffer and die, become our perfect sacrifice, and to die on the cross. He goes on to create animal life in verse 20. Then God said, let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth, earth across the face of the firmament of the heavens. So God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves with which the waters abounded according to their kind and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. So the evening and the morning were the fifth day. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind, cattle and creeping thing, and beast of the earth according to its kind, each according to its kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God creates here an incredible diversity of animal life. You know, science tells us there are more than 800,000 different categories of insects. More than 30,000 categories of fish. More than 9,000 categories of birds. More than 6,000 kinds of reptiles. More than 3,000 kinds of amphibians. More than 5,000 categories of mammals. Folks, and that's just what we know about today. And all because God spoke it into existence. And as He does that, He gives them several commands here. He commands that the waters abound with living creatures. And the waters do abound with living creatures. I know when sometimes when I go to fish, it doesn't seem like it sometimes. <laughs> I've sat there for hours and had no living creature bother me at all. But the truth is, if, even microscopically, when you look at a drop of water under a microscope, you will find more than 50,000 uh, microscopic organisms, excuse me, 500 million microscopic organisms in a single drop of water. God gives the command. And they populate the waters. He gives them another command. He tells them that they are to reproduce and fill the earth. And, and they have obeyed that command. If you don't believe me, put two hamsters in a cage and find out pretty soon. <laughs> but more than that, this verse says that all creatures reproduce after their own kind. Their own kind. When I was in seventh grade, I had a math teacher, and I just, I really liked my math, uh, excuse me, a science teacher named uh, um, Mr. Roberts. I really liked Mr. Roberts. He was a wonderful science teacher. But I learned later that Mr. Roberts told me something that wasn't true. He told me about, he told the whole class, uh, about uh, a group of, of birds that because of, of uh, certain pressures in their environment, uh, they grew longer beaks and shorter beaks. About moths, that because of their environment they would get darker sometimes and they'd get lighter sometimes. And he said because birds can be bred longer beaks or shorter beaks, and moths can be bred to have darker wings or lighter wings, that you could eventually take a dog and breed a horse. That's not true. Folks, no one has ever been able to take a dog and breed it into something else. Now you can take a dog and you can breed a big dog or a small dog or a black dog or a white dog, a sweet dog or a mean dog. You can breed all kinds of dogs, but in the end, you still got a dog. You can do the same thing with horses and cows, but you cannot take a cow and breed it into a rhinoceros. You can't do it. And the reason is 
that whenever uh, breeders try to cross these, these kinds, these, these barriers between different species, they run slap into this, this command by Almighty God to reproduce according to their kind. According to their kind. Finally, we come to the pinnacle of creation here. Verse 26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed to you, that it shall be food for you. Also to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, to every... Everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life. I have given every green herb for food, and it was so. Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. What we have here is the climax, the reason for all of God's creative effort here. Everything else was created in preparation for the coming of God's supreme creation. The only created being which God will have a personal, intimate relationship with is humanity. Human beings. And that even his, his mode of creation is different. With all the other things God creates, he says, let there be. With human beings, he says instead, let us make man in our image. See, this is, this, is, this is a different approach altogether. Here we have a, a, a hint, the first hint in the Bible of the truth of the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit unite in creating this being, human beings, a creature that will be unlike any other. Human beings are not simply animals. And we hear that in our day and time. It is popular in America today for people to say, well, we're just, we're just highly evolved animals. We're no different than any other animal. I've, I've actually read some philosophers who have compared human beings to dogs and puppies and pigs and cats and said we're just no different. Folks, we are different. We alone have been created in the image of God. We are different physically. There is no other creature that is as graceful, that is able to use tools, that can dance, that can grasp, that can work so many ways. Human beings are unique. We're different mentally too. Mankind alone has the capacity to adapt to almost any environment. Mankind alone can invent and innovate and read and write and, and appreciate beauty and create music. Mankind is different. But most importantly, we are not different just physically and mentally. We are different spiritually. We're different spiritually because God created us and us alone for eternity. The Bible says that you will live for eternity. In one place or another, you will exist eternally. Everything else in creation will melt away. Only you and I will last forever. And what's God's evaluation of His work here? Verse, verse 1 of chapter 2. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day God ended His work which He had done, and He rested on the seventh day from all His work which He had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. His work is finished. God rests. Now, God, uh, it, the, the idea sometimes that people will have, they'll look at this and they'll say, well, God just stopped doing anything. Well, that's not true. God is still at work today. He is still holding everything together. What he rested from here was his work of creation. He has finished the work of creation. 
Do you know there's really only one other place in the Bible where it says that God is finished with something? In John chapter 19 verse 30, Christ is hanging on the cross and he declares at that moment, it is finished. What's finished there? Our redemption. He is finished paying for our sins on the cross. But in this case, in this case, he is finished doing the work of creation. And of all the things that God has created, you are his highest work. You are his highest creation. He spoke the sun and moon into existence. That was nothing for him. But Jesus Christ alone died for you. The Bible says that God created you for a personal relationship with Him. But because of our sin, we broke that relationship. And because of our sin, because we have that broken relationship with God, all the pain and all the misery that we see in the world around us has come to be. But God desires to restore that relationship. And so the Bible sent his, said that God sent His only begotten Son Jesus Christ to die on the cross to pay the penalty for your sin that you might be restored to relationship with Him. That you might enter into that relationship for which you were created. You know, it's been said that in every heart, in every soul, there is a God-shaped void. Everyone needs God. Everyone desires a relationship with God. Every one of us has a void that cannot be filled by anything but God. And I've seen so many people try to fill that void with other things. They've <coughs> thrown so many things into it. Money and fame and power and sex and drugs and everything you can imagine trying to fill that void. But the only thing that will ever fill it is a relationship with Almighty God. Because that's why you were created. He created to have a relationship with you. Let me ask you something. Do you know Christ as your personal Savior this morning? Have you come to the point where you recognize that you were a sinner in need of salvation? The Bible says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death, separation from God for eternity in a place called hell. I've already told you folks, every one of us will live forever in one place or the other, either in heaven with God or in hell, separated from His blessing presence for eternity. The Bible says that we all need a relationship with Him. And you can have a relationship with Him. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. In just a minute, we're going to sing a hymn of invitation. And I'm going to be down here at the front. If you don't know this Jesus I've been talking to, and you don't have this relationship with Jesus Christ, this relationship with God that every one of us needs, I'm going to invite you to step into the aisle and come to the front and say, Pastor, I need to know this Jesus. And I will pray with you and I will show you how you can know Christ as your personal Lord and Savior this very morning. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Well, maybe you're out there and you're saying, well, Pastor, I don't know if I'm saved. I don't know. The Bible says these things are written that you might know that you have heaven and eternal life. You can know today. Uh, my desire that none of you would walk out of this, this sanctuary not having a sure and secure knowledge that if you died right now, that you'd be in heaven with Jesus Christ. In just a moment, we're going to sing a hymn. I'm going to be here at the front. On the first verse of that hymn, I want you to step out, come to the front and say, Pastor, I want to know this Jesus. Maybe you're here this morning, Christ is your Savior, but you need a church home. A place where people will love you and care about you. A place where you can serve the Lord. A place where they preach the Word. I'm going to invite you to bring your family to be a part of our family here at Younger's Creek. We'll receive you as a Baptist church, receive these members this very morning. But let's be obedient to what God wants us to do. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love, your grace, your mercy, your kindness. We thank you, Lord, that you are the creator God of the universe. And we thank you, Lord, that you have desired a relationship with us. We ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would move in power amongst us this morning. That you would just rest upon every heart and every mind. And, Lord, for those who do not know Christ, we ask that you would draw them to salvation.
those of us who are believers in Jesus Christ, we ask, Lord, that we would remember that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. We are created as a special order of creation. Lord, we are different. We were created for relationship with you. And Lord, we would rejoice in that relationship. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Let's stand for our hymn of invitation this morning. <laughs> time in his time he made every day as you're teaching me your way that you do just what you say in your time in your time in your time you make all things beautiful in your time Lord my life to you I bring may each song I have to sing be to you a lovely thing in your time in his time in his time he makes all things beautiful in his time, Lord, please show me every day as you're teaching me your way that you do just what you say in your conclude just a couple things. Becky, you want to join me up here? Uh, first of all, we need to present ourselves as candidates for membership at <laughs> Younger Creek Baptist Church. So uh, I'm not sure who, uh, who handles that, but I'll, I'll do the, the, the uh, honors here. All, okay, we have a motion. Uh, we have a motion. Do we have a second? All right, all in favor say aye. aye. All opposed by a like sign. <laughs> Close. That's right. <laughs> uh, announcements very quickly. Uh, I yeah, Adam, have yeah. um, the Valentine's Day, February 18th. I've been announcing the past couple weeks uh, to help raise money for our summer trip to Keogh, Ecuador. Um, so I've actually put another sign up sheet out there. And so if you've already signed up, I'm sorry. You have to sign up to get uh, the sign up sheet. But at this one has uh, what we should food option you want. So we're going to Italian with chicken alfredo or spaghetti and meatballs. Um, it's $15 per plate, $30 per couple, or $40 per ounce per family. So um, sign up for that and just uh, go ahead and make a push meal option if you want. Thank you. All right. Any other announcements? Uh, tonight, uh, 6 o'clock, Brother Tim will be leading us. Uh, as for we want to have a evening <coughs> meeting, first Sunday of the month, we're going to move that to next Sunday. Okay. All right. And we're going to be talking. We're going to be uh, starting a study in Colossians. We're going to be talking about Christ and who He is. Uh, I understand there's some sort of football game or something, but you can <laughs> DVR that or something and, and come out and be with us tonight. And don't worry about that. So let's close with a word of prayer. And uh, I ask, Adam, you close? Yeah. Father, we lift you up this morning, God. We thank you for the truth of uh, uh, creation and the truth of the power that you demonstrated in our world, God. We just we love you, um, and you are worthy of our worship. Father, we pray now that we go into this week that we're going to seek to exalt Christ above all things, um, and that we would interact with others in a way that, that spreads and, and shares the truth of who Christ is and what he's done for us. It's in Jesus' name that we pray this morning. Amen. Amen. Amen.